Hello folks, how's everybody doing? Hope you're doing fine, as fine as I am. <laughs> um, today we're going to have an exciting day, another exciting day of nothing. Been at it for two months now. <laughs> uh, before I do, remind everybody that we have the 7th Rational Physics Conference in Boris, Sweden. Here's the, uh, the uh, information. Okay, it's going to be on June 8th, and we're going to have a lot of fun over there. So if you want to miss it, well, it's your loss, okay? And you'll find information about it in Facebook. Just look up the 7th Rational Physics Conference or in my Patreon side, uh, site, okay? Okay, so let's get on with it. We're going to be doing a little bit of nothing, <laughs> as we've been doing for quite a while. Incredible that it's a subject that um, is, is uh, on the one hand, you could say it's simple, right? Talking about nothing, how long can that last? You know, a few seconds. Uh, and then uh, at the same time, it's a very complex subject, as we've seen, and it's got a long but very long history. Yeah, I guess it dates all the way to the beginning of civilization. People might have asked, you know, what is space? What is nothing? They, they may have had those questions you know, some few thousand years ago. For sure, we know that the uh, Greeks uh, dealt with that issue, and I'm sure people in the East as well. So uh, it's been around for a while. Nothing has been around for a while. Okay, what I want to do is um, uh, wrap up uh, the points that I made last week, okay, uh, regarding the ether and regarding space. Nothing if there's such a thing as nothing. <laughs> uh, and uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about two, uh, three uh, issues, essentially. Uh, we have one case where eth the ether is infinite. It's either infinite or it's finite. The other situation is where the ether is the same thing as space. It is or it ain't. Okay, they're identical or not. And the third one is, um, if it's not a finite, if it's not infinite, it's finite. And if it's not the same thing in space, it's something else. And so those three are the ones that I'd like to wrap up in, uh, in a concise manner so that you get the uh, flow, the reasoning, okay, behind it. Okay, so let's start with um, uh, the infinite ether, okay? Is, is it possible for the proponent, for the theorist, to begin his presentation and say, well, the ether is infinite, okay? Let's look at that situation first. We'll, we'll deal with the others as well. So hold any thoughts that you might have until the end, because I think I'm going to cover every base, and a lot of your questions will probably be answered, okay? So just think about that for a second. Okay, here we have it, okay? Um, here we have the situation. Uh, we say that an object is that which has shape. So um, you cannot introduce the ether as an infinite object because you're saying essentially that it has no shape and you're contradicting the definition of, sh of, of, of an object, of what an object is. You're saying that ether is an object as a whole, right? A medium, an object, a body, but it has no shape. And that's a contradiction. You know, uh, you can say um, your table is infinite. Well, how do you know it's a table? I mean, if it's infinite and you can't point to it, then, you know, you, you don't know if it's a table. You can't even say that it's, uh, you can't even call it a table. Maybe it's a chair. Maybe it's something else, okay? And uh, here, let me show you um, uh, this, uh, no, wrong one. Let me show you here the infinite ether. Here's the infinite ether, okay? And the, uh, so we're assuming that it just continues beyond the uh, frame there, beyond the border, okay? So uh, are we looking at an object? Is, is this an object that we're staring at? How do we know? You know, uh, here you're, you're pointing to something that has no borders. So you're, you're kind of inside it, trying to figure out what's, where the edges are, what, what you're in, 
what you're embedded in, what you're uh, encapsulated in. And so, you know, you can't, you can't say this is the ether because you don't know where it ends. You don't know what you're looking at, okay? And uh, that's one problem, the fact that, you know, you have, um, you have that situation where the ether cannot be infinite because you can't point to it. You can point to a chair because it's finite. And you can't point to an infinite chair because what are you pointing to? How do you know it's a chair? You know, what are you pointing to? Okay. And that's the first issue. The second issue is that you cannot use the adjective infinite. The adjective infinite is an irrational adjective. And let's start here. Let me again put this up there. Okay, what are we saying? We're saying that um, in physics, adjectives can only be used to modify objects. You cannot use them to modify that which is not an object. Okay? If you're saying that uh, there's an object that is infinite, you have an oxymoron. Essentially, you're saying uh, there's, uh, this thing has shape, but it doesn't. Okay, that's, that's the issue. But then again, you're, what you're doing is using an adjective to qualify something which is not a something. Okay, what you what you have is you can only use adjectives to qualify objects. And here, let me give you a, an example here. Okay, to to make it quite. Uh, let's see if I can get it here. No, that's the first one. Here it is. Got so many of these. You can't use adjectives to qualify what is non, a non-object, okay? And you can't say an orbit is red, for example. You can't say there's a strong force. Not in physics, you can't. You can't say you dilated time, excited a field, or that you have a massive singularity. None of these terms are scientific. None of them belong to physics. Okay, because what you're saying is you're, you're applying an adjective to, to something that is not an object. And you might say, well, you know, we do that all the time. Yeah, we do it in, in ordinary speech, not in physics. You cannot get away with this in physics. I'm talking about a new language. So please bear with me. Talking about a new language, you cannot apply adjectives to that which is a non-object. You cannot say that an itinerary is red or, or even long. There's, there's no such thing as a long itinerary. Okay? Uh, that's okay in ordinary speech. In physics, only objects can be long, red, uh, heavy, whatever. You can't say that information is heavy. You cannot use adjectives to qualify that which is not an object, not in physics, okay? And so we have two problems with the infinite ether. The first one is that we're saying that the ether is something that is not a something. You can't see the edges of it. You can't point to it from a bird's eye perspective. That's the first problem. And the second one is that you're saying you have an infinite finite. All objects are finite, and that's what you're saying, essentially. You're having an infinite finite, that's an oxymoron. So for those two reasons, for those two reasons, um, the ether cannot be presented as an object and at the same time be qualified as being infinite. Okay? That's the first objection. Okay, the second one. Um, here it is. It's a series of issues here. Uh, we have the ether can't be equal to space if the ether is made of discrete balls. Uh, either, either space is the same thing as the ether or ether is something different. And if you're going to say that the ether is exactly the same thing as space, we have a little bit of a problem. And part of it is that space encapsulates, uh, gives form to or, or provides a, a contour uh, to each uh, ball. And here let me show you uh, what I'm talking about here. Here you have all these little balls, okay? And if you say that those white balls that are vibrating there is the same thing as the black stuff, 
net or vice versa. The black stuff is the same thing as the white stuff. Well, you end up with this. There you have it. So is that is that what ether is? Just a blank screen? What is that? <laughs> you know, and that's the infinite one. Here's the finite one. Okay. Here you have a box, and here's your ether. It's got all these little balls, but you're saying that the ether is the same thing as the space, at least within the box. Okay. So what are we saying? Well, we're saying that this is what you're saying. You're saying that ether and space are the same thing, whatever the uh, black stuff is. That's a separate issue. But here you're saying that the ether is the same thing as the space. Okay? And so um, here you have no motion, among other things. You know, what is this used for? You know, what, what, can, what can you do with this? You end up with uh, what Parmenides had where there is no motion whatsoever. Okay, and so um, you get this uh, block universe uh, situation. It, uh, like I say there, if instead of ether and space are one and the same, we have a single block universe. That's what you're talking. That's what you're referring to. That's what you're introducing as your hypothesis, as your assumption. And a single block is devoid of waves or particles. You can't, can't have anything moving in there. You can have the whole block move, maybe, if it's flexible. But you cannot say that things inside it can move because you have a single block. There is no difference between the space and the block. Uh, the space and the ether, I'm sorry. The uh, ether balls, because there are no ether balls. You're saying the ether and space are one and the same. There's only one object in front of you. Okay? There, there are no divisions. There's no two colors, no, no two anything. And uh, so we cannot conceptualize motion in, in such a place, right? Single block universe, you can't do absolutely anything with it, okay? So I'm not sure what use you could have if you say the ether is the same thing as space. And we have obviously have a problem if we say the ether is infinite. Fine, whatever ether is, if it's infinite, it's not an object. And it's not an object because there's no such thing as an infinite object. And because, you know, if, if it's infinite, you cannot see the edges of it. And it doesn't qualify as an object under the definition of object, that which has shape. And the alternative, you say, well, you know, I don't like your definition. Fine. No problem. You don't like the definition of physics, of rational physics. Then your, your job is to come up with an alternative definition of the word object, and defend it. And you cannot avoid that definition because physics is founded on objects. You need an object to do physics. You don't need laws like you do in the legal world. You don't need to know about medicine. You don't need to know what a nerve is, not in physics specifically, right? Because you're not doing medicine. So every uh, discipline has uh, its set of words its foundations. For physics, we need objects. And you can't say, well, you know, I don't like to get into semantics and I don't want to do philosophy or ontology or any of that. I'll leave that to the philosophers and the English majors. No. For physics, you need to lay the foundations. You, need, you can't let others define your terms for you in the discipline of physics, at least. You know, you can't say, I'm going to let the English majors tell me what an object is. I'll use whatever they come up with. No, you have to establish the foundations of it. In fact, it works the other way around. You establish the foundations and you tell the guys who write the dictionaries, this is what I want you to put in the dictionary. That's the way it works, okay? They don't define it for you. You have to define it for them so that they know what to put in the dictionary. Okay, so you can't elude defining the word object. An object is that which has shape. You don't like the definition. You have to come up with an alternative definition that you can defend. Then we'll allow you to do physics. Okay, it works that way. Okay, so what's the third problem? The third, uh, I mean, if, if the ether is not infinite, and if the ether is not the same thing as space, then what we have is a finite ether, and we have an ether which is separate from space. Space is some other thing that maybe serves as a container for ether, but they're not the same. And that's the situation I'll discuss now, and that's this one here. Let's look at that one. Here we have the ether and space are distinct 
you know, things. Okay. In this context, the word ether does not refer to one ball or to any individual ball. And I'm talking about the balls that constitute the so-called body of ether. The word ether refers to the entire body of tiny balls that buzz in space. The balls only identify what the ether body is made of. And here, let me show you what I'm referring to. Here you have one little ball of ether, and you have many balls of ether on the right. And what I'm saying is when you talk about the ether, you're not talking about one of those little constituents. You're talking about the entire body. You're saying that when you're saying that the ether vibrates or that there's a bunch of uh, waves uh, in the ether or that the ether is a medium, you cannot talk about one ball. You're not talking about one little particle. You're talking about the entire shebang. So th when you use the word ether, you're not referring to one of the constituents. You're referring to the whole body. Okay? So let's uh, move on here. Let me get to this one. Let's bring this back. Keep losing these. There's so many of them. Okay, so here we have it. So, muriology is forbidden uh, by the definition of object. What is muriology? It's the, um, the things that constitute something. For example, you can say, what is a table made of? And you can go in there and uh, speculate and say, well, it's made out of atoms or it's made out of molecules. That's not what a table is. Table is what you point to. You point to a table and you say table. You're not thinking about the atoms that constitute it when you say table, okay? And that's muriology. Muriology is parts of whole. It's the relationship between small things and big things that they constitute. And that's essentially the situation with ether. People confuse what ether is made of uh, with the body of ether, the thing you can point to. The only way you can point to ether if it's out there, you know, from you see it from a bird's eye perspective. And for that, you would have to draw it. I don't care if you've ever been there. I want to see it on paper or on the screen. You point to it and say, that's the ether. And we have to see a, a fence around the ether. That's the point, okay? And uh, an object is that which has shape and not that which is made of whatever, you know? A table is not what it is made of, okay? Table is what I point to. Uh, that's how I teach uh, the... Um, ET my language, by the way. And therefore, we don't need to get the balls. We don't need all those little particles. All I have to do is get rid of it and just point to the ether. And the ether, in this case, will be the outside of this thing. Okay? And here it is again. That's the ether. The ether is not the little particles it's made of. It's the entire body. Okay? So when I talk about the ether, I'm talking about the block and not about the little particles that constitute the block. Okay? So I can't say the ether vibrates because I'm saying the block is vibrating. That's what I'm referring to. I can't say, oh, the ether, when I use the ether here, I'm going to refer to the little particles that move within the ether. No, because those are particles. Those are not ether. Ether is the whole shebang. Okay? And that's how this has to be analyzed. The ether is the whole box, the whole, uh, that cube or box, the rectangular cube there, okay? That's, that's the ether. And um, here you have uh, ether with waves. I mean, if you're gonna have something that moves in there, right? Um, well then, uh, uh, hopefully that ether is made out of particles or, or whatever that's moving in there, okay? But again, this refers to what it cons what constitutes the ether. Okay, the ether is really the box. This is the ether. Okay, and that's the one when you point and you talk about the ether. That's what you're referring to. Okay. Okay. So what does uh, quantum do? Well, quantum says uh, that this is what they think the the ether in quantum is. In other words, it's uh, what are what are particles? They're vibrating fields. And they're saying, or excited fields or whatever. And they're saying these particles sometimes come into the real world because these are so-called so virtual particles that form the ether or the space in there. And uh, they're saying, they also use the word energy to refer to this. They're saying some kind of vibrating energy, whatever energy is. 
Okay, uh, the issue here is what is the black stuff? What gives shape to those lines, to that particle, to whatever you see there? I see two colors at least in there. And so we haven't gotten rid of the black stuff yet. We need to identify the black stuff. That's the tough part. You know, saying that, that, that a particle is a vibrating field is no biggie. It's, that's the easy part. It's, it's going in there and saying, you know, what is the black stuff? And that's the one that they have never defined in the last 2,000 years. They cannot tell you what space is, what nothing is. Okay, here's the version of uh, relativity, you could say, okay, uh, something like this. You can imagine uh, space-time being four-dimensional. This would be like, I don't know, a, a three-dimensional version pasted onto a two-dimensional platform, okay? But let's assume this is four-dimensional. I don't care. The question is, what is, uh, every line there can be seen. That means each line is contoured. We see two things there at least. And you have to identify the dark stuff that serves as background to each one of those lines and gives them shape. So that's the issue. The issue is, you know, we have to figure out what space is. And this is what the, these people are avoiding. They're avoiding uh, the background. This is the issue. The issue is they're avoiding the background. Now, someone might ask, I don't know, they might say, um, Bill, you go out at night, you see these stars out there. You see the moon, uh, galaxy, whatever you can see there. All these little lights out there in the night sky. What is that black stuff? That's the question people usually ask, you know. What is that black stuff? What are, you, what are we referring to when I point and say, what is that black stuff between the earth and the moon, between the stars? What is that black stuff, that firmament, as they used to call it? <laughs> what is that black stuff? And the first answer is that it's not a what. A what is an object for the purposes of physics. And that thing you're pointing to that you think is a thing is not a thing. It's not a what. The only way, see, I can point to the moon and say, that's the moon. I can point to a star and say, that's a star, planet, whatever. I can point to a dog and say, that's a dog. Why? Because I'm looking at these things from a bird's eye perspective. The thing is completely over there with a shape over there. But now you're asking me to point to that nothing there. And you're asking me, what is that nothing? That's what you're asking. And, you know, if I were outside the universe, I could, God, you know, he, let's assume he can go outside the universe, outside of matter. And here's this bundle of matter there. That's the universe, our, our material universe. And it's all separated by this dark stuff. Well, the question is, does the dark stuff, you know, have a, a border? Does it have a surface? Is, are we talking about a ball, a cube, a pyramid? Is, is, is there uh, a surface that it's encapsulating all the matter in the universe? And we'll call that space. Or the space continue. In other words, there is no space. There is no space as, as a surface. Wherever the matter stops, that's where space stops. Because there is no such thing as space. The only way we identify space, the thing, the dark thing between two objects, is because it's this uh, environment, this background, that serves as a contrast. But if we remove all the matter, do we have a ball there of blackness? Is there a ball? Is there a surface there? This is the issue. I can point to it if I'm in God's shoes. And I can point to space and say, that's space. And I give it a name, space, vacuum, whatever you want to call it, nothingness. But I can only do that if I'm outside of the universe, only, only from a bird's eye perspective. I can't within the ocean say, oh, I'm pointing at the ocean. How do you know you're pointing at the ocean if you're inside the ocean? The only way you can point to the ocean is from far away and say, that's the ocean. That's the Pacific Ocean. If you can see it, I don't know, from space, okay? Then you can say, that's an ocean. That's a lake. If you're inside the lake, you can't point to the lake. You can point to the fish, maybe. Say, that's a fish. That's an object. But you can't point to the lake because you're inside the lake. The only way you can do that is outside the lake, pointing to the lake. Then you can do that from far away. 
And the same thing goes for space. You, get, you cannot ask, what is that black stuff? The only way you can ask what is if you're outside pointing to space, assuming space had some borders, some surface, and you can say that's space. It's an object. In which case, it's very simple. You got to tell me what's outside of space anyways, giving it shape. And we're back to square one. <laughs> so this is the problem. The problem is you need to define the word space. You can't elude it because space is not the same thing as the ether. It's not the same thing as the uh, virtual particles, the energy, the fields. None of that has anything to do with space. Because if they do, we only have one thing, and that would be, like, we call it space. And it wouldn't be vibrating or anything because it's a solid block of whatever. If there are fields vibrating in space, filling space, as they say, then space is something else. And it's very simple. All you have to do is define what space is when you remove energy, fields, uh, virtual particles, ether, whatever you want to remove. Just remove it all. What is space? That's what you got to define. Okay? And until you can do that, you can't talk, you know, uh, sensibly in physics. And in rational physics, it's very, very simple. Very simple. You have to use words. You have to define. And the way we do it in physics, we say an object is that which has shape. Space is that which doesn't have shape. Something, nothing antonyms opposites now we can use those two words consistently okay and now if you're going to talk about fields you're going to talk about ether you're going to talk about energy virtual particles these are separate things from this so-called space thingy which is not a thingy okay and again you can't point you someone says point point to nothing okay i'm pointing there it is i'm pointing to nothing well, no, Bill, you're, you're pointing to the floor. Well, yeah, but the, see, the nothing is what's between my finger and the floor. So what are you pointing to? How can you point to nothing? The only way you can point to something is from far away, from a bird's eye perspective. And by doing so, uh, the question is whether you can point to nothing, to that which doesn't have shape. Assuming you remove all matter in the universe and all you're left with is space, can you point to space from a bird's eye perspective? The only way you can do that, if space has shape. In which case, all you have to do is identify what's on the outside of it, giving it shape. Very easy. That's the story for that. Okay, so why did we bring all this up? Well, we brought all this up because um, electricity magnetism and all these little weird things that we discovered through the years uh, light uh, people identified it with the ether for almost forever in fact today they still essentially uh, uh, identify it with the ether they don't want to call it that but that's what they identify it with they don't they don't know what that is what that what these little things are uh, some people might say well we know what electricity is Okay, what is electricity? That's a flow of electrons. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a flow of electrons. Okay, what is an electron? Well, an electron is a little bead that goes around the atom. I mean, that's the model you see. It's the planetary model. They modify that. They say, well, it's not a planetary model. So what is it? Well, the electron can be here or there. It's not a continuous circle. Fine, who cares? All we're saying is that the little bead is side by side with a bowling ball called a proton. But we still have the planetary model. We have two balls. The only question the guy has to answer, the guy who wants to talk about electricity, is what keeps the electron tied to the bowling ball before you get it to move from atom to atom to create this so-called current. So, so you have to draw the atom before you begin to tell me what electricity is. You have to tell me how you ionize an atom, how you get rid of the electron bead. Why, why is it stuck to the atom to begin with? What keeps it there? Is it maybe the ether, the field, the energy between the, the electron ball and the uh, 
proton bowling ball? What is between these two balls? That's what you got to answer. If you can't answer that question, you can't even start your presentation. You don't have a model. You don't have a model. You can't tell me why the electron B doesn't fall to the positive bowling ball. You can't tell me why it doesn't fly away. You can't tell me what's keeping them together. That's where your entire presentation just failed right there. And no, this is not a question of experimenting. Oh, we don't know. We can't see in it. No, we don't care about that. It's a conceptual issue. I want you to draw on the board what you have in your head. I want you to draw your atom. I don't want you to tell me what Mother Nature's atom exactly looks like. I don't care about her, her atom, really. I care about your atom. You're the guy giving the presentation. You're the guy giving me the theory. I want you to draw on the board your atom, the one that you're going to use. And if you're going to use the planetary Bohr's, planetary Rutherford's, planetary model, uh, before you can tell me your theory, I want you to tell me what keeps the electron tied to the proton. That's how simple it is. Just tell me what keeps it there, we're done. And if you can't do that, we don't want to hear you. you. You have no theory to tell because you have no explanation, no mechanism for what keeps the electron bound to the proton. So they've used the ether throughout the ages for light, for magnetism, for electricity. It was all the, this ether. And we went to the... Uh, Greeks. We came forward to the 17th century, and we found Mr. Gilbert. Uh, he wrote his book in 1600. Essentially, Gilbert, what he did, he uh, did a lot of tricks with magnetism, and uh, he did some tricks also, some experiments, right, with electricity, okay? And what did he do? He invented this electroscope, uh, also known as the uh, versorium. And what it is, it's just a little piece of metal, uh, you can say a little arrow there, and he, <clears throat> what he did, he took some amber, rubbed it, and was able to move the versorium around, okay? In other words, it's, a, it's like a magnet, like a compass, but it's an electric compass, not a magnetic compass, okay? So that's essentially what Gilbert uh, developed. And he also was the guy who figured out that the Earth as a whole is a magnet. Okay, so uh, Mr. Guerke, he's uh, from Germany. Mid-century, he comes up with um, this ball, sulfur ball, which he uh, is able to rotate, create um, static electricity. And uh, he has a lot of fun with this. You know, he, he's able to produce some static electricity, some fun little toys, okay? And uh, they picked that, this idea up in England. Uh, the people who ran the... Um, uh, what is it, the Royal Society, specifically Mr. Uh, Francis Huck, uh, <coughs> Huxby, and uh, he creates his electrostatic generator. He takes the two ideas that Garrique had come up with, uh, the first one being the um, vacuum, uh, the two uh, hemispheres which uh, Garrique was able to evacuate and create a vacuum, and he took that and he took the sulfur ball and he put them together and he came up with this, a glass ball that he could rotate, uh, put his hands on it and create a uh, plasma, you know, a glow, a bluish type of glow. Okay, so uh, this is not where uh, everything ended. From there we went to um, the beginning of the uh, 18th century, right, really uh, about uh, 1745. These uh, people came up with the Leiden jar, and this was a really a uh, big breakthrough, big jump in uh, technology, you could say, or in our understanding. Uh, Kleist uh, here, Ewald von Kleist, he, he, he kind of figured it out by mistake. He got a shock by doing this experiment. He was looking for, for some um, uh, things related to electricity. He was doing some experiments, and he ran this, uh, this little trick with... Um, with essentially with Hawksby's uh, uh, rotating uh, cylinder, right, glass cylinder, and he touched the uh, top of the uh, wire that was connected to that, and it gave him a shock. He wrote about it, and uh, this other guy, uh, Muschenbrook, he picked it up. He picked up this idea uh, in Holland uh, about the same time, a few months later, and he started experimenting with it in more uh, in a more uh, systematic manner, okay? And again, uh, what he had, he had his uh, assistant hold on to this glass 
um, jar, essentially. He had the um, sulfur ball rolling, and he tied a uh, chain to it. And the chain was connected to a wire that went into the glass, the glass jar. As long as it was on the table, nobody noticed anything. But as soon as someone held it and touched that uh, wire on the top, he, he created a short to ground <laughs> and was given a big shock. Okay? And so they discovered uh, essentially that they could store this electricity. This was weird for them because for the first time they were able to store electricity and uh, uh, have some um, repercussions. It, it had uh, an effect, on a physical effect on them. They still didn't know they could use this for anything, but it was like, oh, Jesus, this is, this is something interesting. You know, I touch this, and I get this big shock. And they didn't want to do it a second time. Uh, the, once they did it once, uh, that was it. They never went back to it. Okay. And um, so uh, uh, what they started doing after that is putting them together, putting two of these together, two, three, four. And one of the persons credited with that is this uh, fellow, Daniel Graloth. Um, apparently, a few months after they, uh, they discovered the uh, Leiden jar, it's called Leiden because of Muschenbrick, because he, he taught in uh, Leiden. And um, uh, Graleth learned about it. He started doing his own experiments. He put several of them together. Uh, this, I think, was in April of uh, 1746, almost mid-century. And he started playing around with several of these uh, to try to get more power out of them. And another fellow, Johann uh, Winkler, a German guy, uh, he did the same thing about the same time. A little later, uh, he wrote about it in, in more detail. And so there, there's a, a debate on who, who really discovered the, the uh, many uh, Leiden jars, which is really a, a capacitor, our, our, our understanding of what a capacitor is, right? This is a different format of a capacitor, not the one that you'll find in your uh, electric circuits for sure. And uh, anyways, they wrote about it, and they started putting them together and creating more and more electrical power. By the end of the uh, century, uh, around, uh, what was it, 1784, I think it was, um, this fellow, um, he um, uh, creates uh, what is known as the electric machine, or what he called the electric machine. Okay, And this electric machine, he just put tons of these Leiden jars right all over the place he tied them all together and he was able to create 330,000 volts they say okay 330,000 volts and uh, if you go to the museum over there in uh, in Holland you'll find um, uh, these these uh, th this uh, museum okay and uh, uh, it's still there you can see them in person right because it's still there it's uh, one of those holdovers from the 18th century, when I mean, you can see how complicated it was, they had all these Leiden jars just tied together and creating um, a, a giant capacitor. Essentially, they could they could get uh, electricity out of this thing. They still couldn't do anything with it, as far as I'm concerned. They they would do some experiments, but uh, it's not like they you know they they could use it for lighting a city or anything like that. It was just um, to create uh, electricity and be able to use it. For experiments to to understand nature, if you can, if you want to think of it that way. Okay, towards the end of that same century, uh, about um, 18, uh, 1777, uh, we have this fellow Coulomb, which I talked about the other day, and um, he did an experiment uh, also with electricity, in which he took static electricity, he charged up a little ball, and he had it uh, being repulsed. Okay, he measured the, the torque that was created on the string that held the contraption. Then he went in there, uh, re, um, it took some of the charge away from the uh, thing that he was using, the little ball, the blue ball there that he was using to um, kick the other one away. And uh, he found out that it, the ball did not go as far as the first time. And so he was able to calculate, to come up with an equation which is the one coming up here in a second here. Um, he was able to look at this equation where the um, charges, um, 
uh, were governed. In other words, the attraction or the repulsion between them uh, had to do with how far they were. In this case, uh, well, it's radius, should be distance. Uh, but yeah, they always calculated based on radius. But it's the distance between the charges that gave, gave it how much force uh, there was uh, intervening in that situation. And it's what's interesting about this is that uh, also is that Cavendish is going to use the same experiment, the same type of experiment to calculate the gravitational constant G, which has to do with gravity. Okay, but he uses the same uh, notion, uh, um, a, uh, a string that holds, um, you know, to, in, in his case, it was two uh, weights, and he showed that they, uh, they attract also... Um, as a function of distance, mass and distance. Okay, uh, we didn't stop there. Uh, right at the end of the century, uh, 1792, we have this uh, group of people. Uh, well, first of all, we have these, uh, this group of people. You can see uh, their names. Uh, you probably recognize all these names. You have Watt, which we use for uh, power especially in uh, electricity. You know, you talk about bulbs, how many watts they have, 40 watts or whatever. Uh, we have Mr. Galvani, which um, if you look at the uh, word uh, galvanic or anything related to that name, it's got to do with uh, applying a stimulus, right? And we have Mr. Volta. You heard of the volts. That's uh, in honor of Mr. Volta. Uh, that's a measure of uh, also of um, you know, voltage across a circuit. And we have Mr. Ohm, he comes a little later, but the reason I put him there is because you can see that we went from doing experiments and something a little more solid to getting more abstract uh, towards the uh, beginning of the 19th century. Uh, these other people did some abstractions as well, you know, uh, they did some math, but uh, you're going to see that as time goes by, we're, we're doing less experiments. Uh, real life experiments and we're doing more and more math. That's going to be uh, almost an inevitable trend. Okay, uh, Mr. Watt, what is he famous for? Well, uh, supposedly he invented the, uh, the engine, uh, the uh, steam engine. Okay, Let me get back in here. Uh, he, 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 he didn't invent it really, he just perfected or made it better, he made it more efficient. And uh, the reason his name Watt is applied to, you know, to power is because it has to do with the steam engine, not with electricity. Okay, and uh, here I have uh, uh, Mr. Tom uh, Thomas Newcomen, and he created this uh, little device, which was a major, a big one, really. And uh, it was uh, run by steam. You would throw um, coals into a furnace. Uh, the furnace would heat up some water, the vapor would push the piston upwards, okay, and you created some mechanical uh, work. And uh, then when you would cool that same, uh, uh, that same cylinder, the, uh, water, the vapor in the cylinder, and it would cool down and again uh, the cylinder would come down. And so it was a very simple device and they used it especially in mining and um, you know, uh, this was uh, used uh, part of the fuel for the um, Industrial Revolution. You're talking again, uh, uh, 18th century, right? And they use this throughout the century. Mr. Watt comes over and um, he uh, perfects this. He makes it more efficient. And here's uh, his version. Okay. Again, the little furnace there, uh, uh, the cylinder, the vapor. And they were able to use this for heavy work. And uh, Watt uh, did a lot of improvements. He, uh, he, he didn't write anything. What he did, he patented a lot of this stuff. And he sold his machines uh, throughout Europe. And a lot of people wanted to learn his secrets, and he kept a very tight lid on them. He didn't want anyone knowing, you know, how he did a lot of this stuff. Uh, but that's, uh, so what has nothing really to do with electricity proper, but his name was introduced for power, okay? And, uh, okay, so um, then comes Mr. Galvani, 1792, now yes, uh, here. And he uh, does a little experiment. He, uh, he was a physician. He started uh, 
wondering about electricity, animal electricity. And he had this idea that animals had electricity. And he said he proved it with this little experiment where he took um, uh, an electrified rod, you know, and he touched the uh, uh, muscles of a dead frog and, and gave that little kick. And so he was convinced that, you know, uh, animals had this fluid in them that was electricity. Okay, so uh, he invites a, uh, another fellow who was uh, quite um, knowledgeable about electricity, maybe the top of the line in those days, and that's Mr. Uh, Volta. And um, Volta is uh, going to look at his experiment, and he's going to start doubting. He says, no, uh, it's the um, rod that you're using. That's the one that's electrified, not, not the animal. It's the uh, chemical reaction with the metals that you're using to touch it. And so he creates, as a result of that, he creates uh, what is known as the pile. In fact, in, uh, in Argentina, we still call it la pila, uh, pile, uh, because it was a pile. As you can see, it was a pile of uh, coins, you could call them, uh, little discs. And he had these copper and zinc discs, and they were separated or, or mediated by um, First, first he dipped them in salt water, and then he eventually had a little cardboard in there, which was dipped in salt water, and he used those cardboards as separators. But essentially, he built a whole bunch of these and found out that he could store electricity because, you know, he could use this. He, he could not only store it, but he could store it for several days and use it whenever he wanted it. Now, for the first time, it looked like uh, this had some future that they could do something with all of this, okay? And uh, so uh, now we're making some progress. This is the end of the 18th century. And we've gone now, you know, from doing little experiments to where they can store for the first time, uh, you know, with the Leiden jars. Now they can store electricity, you know, as something that until then was thought of impossible. You know, how can you store electricity? And he was able to do it. Volta was able to do that. Now, that didn't deny really, because in those days, it, uh, uh, he was considered the uh, guy who, who was successful in proving that it was a chemical reaction and that Galvani, you know, was wrong. And, uh, you know, today, I think we can safely say that, you know, our bodies have electrochemical processes. We have, uh, in the neurons, we have, you know, between neurons, we have the uh, synapses. And, um, and those are considered to be electrochemical processes. So, so we do have, to use Galvani's term, we do have animal electricity, okay? But uh, the interesting thing is that because of their debate, one guy was saying it was an animal electricity, the other guy was saying, no, it's, a, it's the chemical uh, reaction of the metals. Uh, it compelled Volta to go out there and do some experiments and, um, and eventually come up with the first capacitor, which is the pi hole. Um, it's, it's really uh, uh, what is known as a battery. Okay? And what is interesting is also that you know, they, they did batteries with Leiden jars. Okay? Uh, all these uh, Leiden jars that they put together, that was essentially a, a battery, the first battery, but it was a different type of battery than what you, you know, your little <laughs> battery that you use these days. Uh, it was a monster and it was able to store charge. And now with the Volta pile, it simplified things quite a bit because now they can have this little pile of uh, coins, of discs, and they were able to produce, they were able to store and then produce the electricity. And this is going to take off. This is going to take off because people are going to use the pile throughout the uh, beginning, of the first, I'd say the first quarter, maybe the first half of the um, 19th century, and all experiments are going to be done with a pile. They're just going to put two electrodes tied to either end, and they're going to use that as electricity until we improve, you know, on the on that system. Anyways, uh, well, here I can uh, show you one more thing. I'm going to show this next time, but here we have a Russian. And his name is Vasily Petrov, and he takes a whole bunch of these piles 
Once he finds out about it, he takes 4,200 voltaic piles, okay, which is uh, this battery. And it's called battery, by the way, because uh, uh, I think it was Franklin. Uh, there's a debate on who, who came up with this name, but there's a debate on that. But uh, they, they uh, re uh, said it resembled a whole bunch of cannons, Okay, and you know you have a battery of cannons there. Well, this was something similar. You have a battery of uh, of piles. You know all these little piles, one right after another. And what what uh, this guy Petrov did? He put four thousand two hundred of them, uh, and he created a spark. He put spark together and created this arc light. And the guy who creates the arc lamp, uh, very intense light, just by putting two carbon pieces together, which were tied to a battery to uh, pile okay and uh, so this is uh, this is uh, already at the beginning of the 19th century so I'll continue with it next time but you can see where this is all headed uh, these um, folks begin to play around with a pile and uh, battery if you will and uh, they're gonna start doing some useful experiment well Experiments are not really useful except for understanding if you can understand what you did, uh, but they start using it in the industry and uh, uh, they're, they're, they're going to try to look for what uses they can give to all these things. Among them, yes, you'll find out the telegraph, eventually the telephone and so on down the line. But that's 19th century. Here we finish the uh, 18th century and essentially what we have is um, the Leiden jar, typical of the 18th century, and the pile towards the end of the century. But with these two things, now we're starting to understand electricity. We're able to store electricity. That's the important part. We're able to store it. See, until then, when you had Hawksby machine, all he could do is say, look, I put my hands there and create some blue light plasma. Great. And then you went home and said, hey, that was a nice little trick. Uh, I can show it to my friends. Uh, they did the, uh, what I showed the other day, the flying boy. Uh, they did the, the electric kiss. The girl kisses this guy and gets a static shock. You know, all that was simple stuff. Now we're talking about a little more complicated, uh, complex things where you're storing electricity in, here in the Leiden jar, here over here in the uh, uh, pile, in Volta's pile. And that's how the century is going to end. And now we're going to start with the 19th century where especially the pile, the uh, battery, is going to be um, used in uh, labs. And they're going to start playing around with this, uh, with electricity. And uh, we're going to understand, well, I'm not sure if we're going to understand, but they're going to play around with it and see more effects. Okay. And that doesn't mean we understand. In fact, no one today still in quantum or in uh, mathematical physics in general understands what electricity is or what magnetism is for that matter or light. We'll see you next time and we're going to continue with the 19th century. Bye-bye.